slide. All right, there we are. Okay, good morning everyone. This is the subdivision committee meeting for March 10th, 2022. Let's start with roll call. I'm Russ Ford, Planning and Building Services. Alexander Sequera, uh, Transportation. Marlena Dooley, Environmental Health, Land Use. Good morning, everyone. Okay, first item uh, two, Subdivision Committee Administration. <clears throat> Discussion and possible action, including adoption of resolution of the Mendocino County Subdivision Committee, finding that state or local officials continue to recommend measures to promote social distancing in connection with public meetings. That's our monthly resolution. Can I have a motion? My motion that we approve the resolution as stated. I second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next up, item 3A, boundary line adjustment B 2021-0066 for Man Pritpal Singh. This is a boundary line adjustment to merge three parcels into one parcel in the Brook Trails area. 2.7 miles northwest of Willits on the east side of Sherwood Road at 25251 Sherwood Road. Uh, is there anybody here for this application? Go ahead. I do not see anyone in the waiting room. Okay. Let me look at attendees. We have a Judy Martin. She's here. And then we have a 415. If you can raise your hand if you're here for this boundary line. Were you expecting me? No, I think so. And I have to be <coughs> Okay. So I'm gonna... Okay, uh, environmental health. Any comments? No comments. Transportation? No comments. Okay, and planning is recommending approval with standard condition seven. I'm sorry, special condition seven, which is that a note shall appear on the deed indicating that this is a voluntary merger of parcels. So can I get a motion? All right, I move that we approve boundary line adjustment 2021-0066 with special planning condition that a note shall appear on the final map stating this is a voluntary merger. On the deeds. There's on no the deeds that this is a voluntary merger. I second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, so we have no minor subdivisions today. So that brings us to item 5A, which is a pre-application conference, PAC 2021-0004 for the Mendocino Coast Humane Society. This is to demolish the vacant building and add 938 square feet to the existing 3,700 square foot ARC thrift store to be used for receiving and sorting donations and minor renovations to the interior. So who is here for this project? Judy, you said? We have Judy here okay. from the, the director of the Humane Society and her work partner, I believe, is the 415 number. Okay, so let's bring Judy in. All right, Judy, you're coming into the meeting. All right, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, um, so Judy, why don't you give us a little outline of, of your project, and we'll start with that. Um, okay, um, so our ARC thrift store uh, that we've had for about 30 years now, we have a house that is adjacent to it and it's a, a dangerous structure and we would like to demolish that um, to re remove the house and then we have a, the thrift store was never really made for being a store so the workspace is not really adequate um, for what we the business that we run so we would just like to add on um, a little bit of an extension on the back the backyard of the thrift store to give more of like a warehouse feel in the backyard for a easier accepting of donations and sorting um, for our thrift store. So it's, that's okay. kind of all. <laughs> that seems pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. Can you give us a, some little planning review here? Um, so the property is zoned appropriately and, um, and the project will require a fiscal development permit. 
as well as a coastal development permit and air quality demolition permit to um, that will be needed in order to apply and take out the building department's demolition permit as well as a building permit for the addition which a new note to that is that CAL FIRE will now be required. When you originally applied, uh, CAL FIRE was for only for new structures, but they're actually now doing increased uh, footprint. Okay. So um, the process for that is you'll apply for your building permit, and once you apply, the building department will give you a number to apply to CAL FIRE with. Okay. Another big Great. note is that our fees are going up on March 14th. So the fees that we quoted you um, are only good until March 13th for you to apply for that CDP. Okay. okay. Uh, otherwise, they're going up. And I'm sorry, I don't have the new fee here, um, but you could you could guess by a couple of thousand dollars. Approximately 25%. Okay. Approximately 25%. All right. Um, so the CDP would cover both the demo and the expansion that could all be done under one? It could be done on the same CDP as long as all of the work is listed clearly. Okay. And in preparation for the CDP, um, you're going to need a biological survey and an archaeological survey possibly. Um, okay. As well as water and septic site evaluation. Okay. So I, I sent you a list of evaluators with the pack. Packet, um, but we can get that for you again. Or uh, no, I have, have that. Excellent. I have all that. Yep. Do you have any questions? I do not. I do not at all. Okay, it's let's go to uh, let's go to building. So um, we have Mike Oliphant, our chief building official, with us today because this does have some some building elements. Mm -hmm. So I was going to have him chime in and see what kind of requirements you'd have to meet for the building division. Okay. Good morning. This is Mike. So first of all, you're within the, you're outside city limits, but you're within the rural Fort Bragg Fire District. So mm -hmm. it's going to be important that you uh, contact the fire marshal, Wells, to uh, let them know about the project and see where the, the fire district's going to stand for fire sprinklers for your project. If I think we've, okay. okay, I think we've already done that, but I, I, I got it, no problem. Okay, great, great. So um, also this is gonna be, the plans will be designed by a licensed architect or engineer, correct? Yes, correct. So it's gonna be important that that architect or engineer is well versed in California state accessibility regulations because okay. uh, chapter 11B of the California Building Code does require accessibility upgrades to take place on this project. So I don't remember, it's been many years since I've been in your building if you have an accessible bathroom or not, but that's gonna come up in the discussion. Um, okay. You're, we, we're gonna start at the parking area in front with the parking area with the van unloading signage and a path of travel to it. But it's going to be important for your architect or engineer to address all accessibility regulations on your plans. Okay. okay, that makes sense. Okay. Got it. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to environmental health for water and septic concerns. Hi, Judy. I don't know if you viewed your file from the Fort Bragg office or not, but there's not much in it. We don't have a map of where the existing systems are, mm -hmm. and um, that'll be part of the discovery. Uh, it can be that we'll allow you to continue to use what's in the ground and not have to expand, mm -hmm. but we will need absolutely on record an area on the parcel that will be reserved for the replacement leach field. And that will not be built, but it will be memorialized in the file so that future development on the parcel does not overdevelop the septic capacity. So I hear you have our list of qualified site evaluators, which is great. Mm -hmm. And we can talk some more about the details of what would be possible on that parcel and your water requirements. You are in the coastal zone, but you're not necessarily expanding the use. So I would certainly want to talk with you about 
your water supply and how it did in the drought and um, what kind of test we would want. Really the two testing requirements in the coastal zone are either a well pump test, which is a water quantity mm -hmm. test, or a hydrological study, which is a much larger study involving your neighboring parcels. And okay. I would say that you have a very good case in that you're not going to be expanding the water use on site. It seems with the demolition and non-replacement of the house that it will be um, reduced. Mm -hmm. But with our, with our drought conditions, particularly on the coast, we're gonna have to talk about that. And um, so I would recommend getting some data. Do you have any use records for how much water's being used? Um. I, I, we might, uh, we might, um, that I know we have a lot of water. Um, at one point we had too much water. Um, so I, I do, I do not know off the top of my head if we have that, but we can definitely get that. Um, we've, yeah, I can, I can definitely get that. I just we say, I'm just warning. It'll be a topic of conversation, right? You know? So, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. No problem. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Was that all, all EH concerns? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, transportation, Alex. Yeah, so I was looking at it. It seems like most most uh, people that are visiting the store are accessing off of um, Highway One and. Um, you know, it'd be Caltrans jurisdiction, but it looks like, you know, you guys have paved driveways out mm -hmm. front. I was wondering where, where do you guys, do you guys do most of your receiving from people bringing stuff to the front or people driving to the back off of? Uh, to, to the front right now. To the front right now. Is there, is there proposed to have a drop? You know, I, I look at the layout of the building and it looks like, you know, they have the bay door coming to the back entrance there. Is there plans to use that back entrance off Old Coast Highway more than it currently is used? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah we were hoping to have, uh, people usually do come around the back, the back street there on Old Coast Highway and we'll drop off there because it's convenient and then come back around and join the roundabout. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that that is ideal. For us would be for people to come along the back there and drop off and then just head on through the roundabout okay um you know that may be a concern of mine I, I, um i believe that's like a gravel driveway uh that interfaces with the county road um and i i'm not sure about the the drainage um for that driveway of how well that you know i think there's an old culvert um, there. there's actually, there's actually a new culvert that was put in there, um, less than 10 years ago. Um, it was right around the time they did the roundabout. They, when they did the roundabout, they had to redo a whole bunch of stuff around us and they redid our culvert back there. Um, hmm. so I know that right there under our driveway has a, a semi new culvert. Um, but I can, we can work on that. But yeah, I know that when the roundabout happened, they had to redo a whole bunch of stuff with our entrance and our exit okay. and our driveways. Yeah yeah I, i'm just you know that may be of um a concern if that you know if if that um if that's the same location that you you know the same uh, location of the driveway that you'll be using for the building or you know you need to move it at all but if you're using that same location it may need to be brought up to county standards which is okay to have it you know uh paved um and especially if you're going to be using it more than it currently is used definitely uh, yeah so that that would be our only thing if the culvert's still good then yeah we won't have to replace the culvert maybe just put some head walls on the end of the culvert to meet our standards but um okay. yeah so great, that would great. be that'd be it from the transportation and uh alex i know it's not really our our purview but um, yeah. caltrans would have any concern about that access there it's pretty close to the roundabout he, um for for the access off Old Coast Highway? No, for the one that off of State Route One, and I know it's probably it was probably considered when they put the roundabout in. Yeah, I, I would imagine. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, Caltrans has the opportunity to comment on the on the project, 
you know, it looks like everything is paved. I, you know, and they had made these improvements on the roundabout mm-hmm. went in. So I, I wouldn't imagine that they would have uh, any comments, but, you know, that's for, for their um, jurisdiction to decide. Um, yeah, and, uh, Judy, yeah, I don't see anything though. Sorry. Um, and <clears throat> Judy, that's something you might consider doing some preliminary outreach just to Caltrans and see okay. if they would have any concerns. Perfect. And I don't have any, uh, the, the other driveway on the property is the one that accesses the, the old house that is going to be torn down. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a problem with that driveway remaining there. It doesn't sound like that one is, once that house is gone, I don't, you know, are there any plans to use that back area for anything else or? No, not, I mean, not at the moment. We don't, we're not going to okay. be developing anything there. Um, okay. Yeah, if anything, it'll turn into a giant parking lot. But as of right now, nothing. Yeah, if, if in the future it does, um, you know, increase the usage from what it is now, that, that might be a um, concern from DOT later on. But uh, as of right now, it's, you know, um, not really going to be used. So um, no concern there. Wonderful. Okay, I think that's about all that we have, Judy. Do you have any other questions or anything you want to No, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's, that, um, I got all the information I need. We'll get all of our ducks in a row. Great. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we'll have the information on file here for a while. So if you do need to follow up, um, just contact one of us and we'd be happy to help you. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have agenda item 5B, which is pre-application conference 2022-0001 for Las Primas LLC. The applicant is Rob Buckle. This is a pre-app conference to review and provide feedback regarding the construction of a modular storage complex and the conversion of the indoor space to storage units. The outdoor construction and related tree removal would likely require a major vegetation removal request. Okay, so who is here for this application? Most of these folks. Can you raise your hand, either Joseph or the 415 number, if you're here to speak about pre-application 2022-1 for Las Primas? I believe Mr. Buckle is the 415 number. All right, the 415 number is coming into the meeting. He's currently muted. There we go. Okay, I, I guess I was muted. I'm sorry, this is Rob Buckle, I'm here. Hi, Rob. Um, why don't you give us a quick outline of your project here this morning? Sure. Um, did you guys get a chance at all to take a look at a couple emails? I mean, it, it gets a little bit uh, comp. I mean, I can give you a short answer to it, but there's the, you know, information within the email as far as my questions. But as you had mentioned, I'm trying to, to you know, do a, a couple projects. There's the back, uh, what is it, northeast part of the property that I was trying to do, um, you know, outside pods, uh, eight by twenties. And within the couple emails that I sent to Steve, there's a kind of a map and a layout of what I'm trying to do. Um, when I was on site, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, um, with the tree removal and I put it within these emails, I only counted about 15 trees that would need to come down after that it's either 20 or 25 foot setback that I learned from Steve from the residential back part of the property. So you would have that uh, buffer there. And then once you start that line, you know, I'm looking at maybe about 15 trees that would need to come down and, you know, five of them might be over two foot in diameter. The other ones are, are, are pretty, you know, minor, um, you know, small. Um, I did get a sense from some pictures that were sent back and forth to a biologist that there might be some British pines there. Um, Still not confirmed, but um, I think there might be. But again, when I walked it, uh, you know, know, six months ago, whatever it was, it seemed like there was a lot more. So anyways, and that's in efforts of, you know, trying to keep the nursery there, which I want to keep, um, you know, to utilize that back part of the property for that part of the project. And then the other phase that I wanted to do is there's the a couple existing buildings there. I don't know if you're familiar with the property, but there's a bigger building there with the herbal legend um, in the middle is a moving company. 
And then on the tail end of it, um, the nursery actually um, leases that part out. So the middle part of the uh, big building, I was trying to do some interior um, indoor storage units. And there's enough headroom there for two stories. And then there's another building in the back there. I think it's on your record as the muffler um, shop, but that would be another building that I would try to do some interior, you know, storage. Um, are you guys able to pull up that email at all? Because I, I can just read through it. Um, I mean, there's quite a few questions. I don't know if we're going to get through them all, but um, it's a pretty organized uh, email if you guys have it in front of you. Yeah, Steve sent that on yesterday, so I think we've all had a chance to look at it. Um, so okay. why, first, why don't we go to Steve and, and just do a quick little planning recap on the stuff that he's he's made notes of already. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good morning. So the property is in as commercial district, and the requested use of wholesaling storage and distribution, many warehouses, would require a social development use permit. Uh, the applicant has expressed intent to remove the dense mixed pine forest running shrubbery towards the rear of the property in order to grade the site and install prefabricated salt storage units made from converted shipping containers. Uh, this activity would likely qualify as a major vegetation removal or harvesting, and it would require an associated development permit. Uh, the permitting of this tree removal activity would, would likely require a biological survey for analysis and referral to relevant agencies, such as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the California Native Plant Society. If those agencies recommend habitat restoration, the applicant would be required to submit a restoration plan and replant the removed species either on site or at a contracted location nearby. Um, the applicant mentioned that there might be bishop pine present, and that is what I viewed as well upon my site visits. So that is certainly a consideration. Uh, the applicant should also be made aware that a development buffer may be required if an environmentally sensitive habitat area or ESHA is identified in the proximity of the development proposal area. Uh, the applicant should also be made aware that if there are any archaeological resources discovered, that the development would need to be seized and, uh, and a, an archaeological specialist would, would need to come and stake out the site for any resources found. Um, regarding the setbacks, so specifically for mini warehouse buildings, uh, the driveways need to have a minimum width of 24 feet to accommodate temporary parking vehicles during loading and unloading operations. And regarding the building setbacks, there are no minimum front rear or side yard setbacks for C districts, commercial districts. However, if it abuts a district other than commercial or industrial, such as to the rear of the site, there would be a 20 foot required setback from the residential zone uh, to the rear. Uh, any new development will also require a 45 foot minimum corridor preservation setback from the center line of Highway 1, uh, to which the site abuts. And the maximum lot coverage for C districts is 50%. So that's something to keep in mind when developing the site with uh, these mini warehouses. Could, could, could you just go over that last part again? I, I got the the twenty foot setback in the back, but just the other you said forty five feet or something. It kind of got broken up a little bit. Sure. Any new development would require a forty five foot minimum corridor preservation setback from the center line of Highway One. Okay, got you. So I got that, and that's there. I think that 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 should be more than enough room from the center of Highway One, and then the measurement after that one you said. The, 50 oh, so the maximum lot coverage for C districts is 50%. Uh, 50%. I don't know why I'm having a hard time hearing this. Say that one more time. Yeah, 50% uh -huh. of 50 the would be the maximum lot coverage. The mass oh, maximum lot coverage. Got it. Okay. So, Steve, do we have any idea what um, are these? There's, I see there's three separate APNs. Do we know if those are separate legal parcels or how many different parcels? Oh, uh, I'm not sure, but they are likely being sold together. So it's potential that it, that it would be considered as such. So that's something you may want to look into, Rob, and see if, if you've separate legal parcels in there or if it's just one thing with different numbers. 
I, I, uh, okay, I, I think it is three different parcels. And if that's the case, what's that mean in this case, as far as doing what I wanted to do in the back or within the, the two buildings? Well, just for the purpose of this comment, that 50% lot coverage would apply individually to each of those parcels. They would be separate. Okay. Ver verse. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So 50% of the lot can be used per parcel. Okay, so that's going to, you know, cut off some of the ability in the back, if I'm hearing this right, right? I mean, we have the 20-foot setback, and then if that's, say, just one parcel, then I only can put as much containers on that parcel up to 50% of that lot size? Correct, yeah. Is that, is that what I'm hearing right now? Yeah. And I don't, Steve, refresh it, my does that include um, roadways, lot coverage? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Any paved surfaces? So, so Steve, you, you were on site with me, I don't know, whenever it was a few weeks back. So just so I understand it, and then I don't know if it would make sense to, you know, put everything within one parcel. I don't know if that helps my situation or not. I'd have to think about it. But just assuming that back uh, part that I wanted to develop, um i can only develop 50 percent of that after that 20 foot setback or does the 20 foot setback get included in that or the it's it's about the lot size so it does not involve the setback so you'd be able to to remove that required setback from the lot coverage uh calculation but um we would need to determine if the nursery property is considered a development uh, based on whether or not it's paved and, and just how the uh, nursery is has been developed. Uh, and then, of course, the, the existing buildings would be considered development on the parcels. Okay, so if I'm hearing this right, so if that part in the back, uh, the nursery, if that takes up that 50% of that parcel, I can't do anything there, huh? Right. Okay, well, that, that's a big one, so. Yeah. Right, and that would require um, a further investigation as to the status, whether or not the nursery would be considered uh, developed. Um, and then also, if it's considered one legal parcel, you can use the uncovered portions of the, of, of the, the three parcels uh, together for that calculation. So that would require a little more um, research and and i could certainly get back to you afterwards yeah for her and and you know i'm just trying I'm, as you see in my email i'm in escrow right now and i've got till the end of this month to kind of make a decision so i'm um, under a little bit of pressure uh you know to make a decision here um mr. would buckle. you consider mr buckle uh, sorry. Hey, yes. I think it might behoove you if I share my screen and we look at this parcel the way it's laid out, because I think that would help you see what would be limiting you for development. Would that be all right? Oh, 100 percent. Yes. So I go to the email, Steve, that you sent this morning or. Or how, can, is that, can I be is allowed to share correct? screen? I'm sure I can. Yeah, I'm not sure if yeah. yeah. on Zoom, if uh, you would you to join the Zoom link. There you go. So I'm, I'm okay. looking at an email. Sorry. So these are your the parcels we're talking about. One goes this way, so half nursery, half open. One is a flagship, so this section here and all this back section here, and then this one is these structures. So if they were all separate lots, this one's pretty much covered. I don't see you being able to expand I more than that footprint. I saw your plans and you looked like you wanted to go this way, across this way, across that way. And if they're separate, it would be really just this way, like two horseshoes we would be talking about. But I, I'm not looking at what you're seeing. I got to really, I, I don't know where you're at. So could you direct me on what you're actually looking at and tell me what you uh, just told uh, me? Rob, do you have the link to the, the Zoom meeting? I, I'm pretty sure, Steve, if you could just jump in, that's the email that you sent to me today, correct? Yeah, and I can resend it right now to the top of your email. Yeah, I, 
I, I made the email. I just need to know what attachment she's looking at. I've got one, two, three, and four attachments. So I'm on the direct. screen. I, I guess you don't have a screen for the Zoom? No, I'm looking. Uh, yeah. Well, I have a screen that I'm looking at an email uh, PDF that was sent to Steve. So I think I have the information you're looking at. I just need, I just need to know what you're actually looking at. Well, can really you, you right look at us? Now. Can you look at the, the box that has us talking to you? Uh, I'm not set up like that. I'm sorry. I told okay. Steve earlier my camera and whatever, and I just called into the number. Okay. I'm sorry. It. I thought you were in the video portion of the Zoom because that's what we're all looking at. <laughs> Okay, but I'm sorry. No problem. But your your two parcels are um, they run long from Highway One back, and they're cut pretty much down the middle with a little one notched out. So you would really have to re-examine your whole project if you were going to find that they're separate parcels. But my records that go back to the '80s have them as one legal lot since then. So I don't really think that's the case. That it's not one full lot. You're saying that's not the case. You think it is broken up. And I think it was three parcel numbers that I've seen, you know, going through the research. The on past that. CDPs allowed conversions to the nursery and those were across two lots and they did not create an issue. I'm not the planning department though. So they're the ones that really are to make that determination or, you know, they're the authority on that. But from the past plans that were approved for the commercial uses, it was not an issue. Uh, I have a question. Um, so according to the Mendocino County Code, lot coverage means the percentage of gross lot area covered by all buildings and structures on the lot, including decks and porches, whether covered or uncovered, and all other projections except eaves. So it does not include paved surfaces. Um, so that, that is very important. And that would certainly bring your lot coverage, your existing lot coverage uh, much further back. Um, the paving, it does, it, it's considered for other uh, aspects of, of planning review, but in terms of lot coverage, the definition is, is any buildings or patios. So that would certainly open it up a lot more for, our, for development opportunity for you, Rob. Yeah, because that was one of my questions, and maybe you were just saying it, because the nursery, of course, has that bigger building, and then they have all that outside space where they have the plants. So is the outside space considered development? Right. So the, so with, according to the county code, it would not if it's not a vertical structure such as a deck and porch. So okay. I know, I believe that some portions of the nursery might be on a deck, but otherwise uh, it would just be the buildings. So, and it would not okay. be okay so that's very beneficial so that helps and then in the back since these you know pods they're not you know a fixed structure i mean there's a lot of the storage unit facilities right around this property and they have you know your roof and you know foundation the whole you know litany that goes through it so th these are just you know you take down the trees if i'm able to you do some light grading and then you have structures that are not say fixed they're just the pods that if you guys looked at the email i sent there was a picture of them so does that uh consider it development um on the property even though they're just freestanding pods for fixed uh um, storage units so the go ahead steve sorry the Okay, so the definition of structure means anything constructed or erected, the use of which requires location on ground, including but not limited to any building, road, pipe, loom, conduit, and it goes on. Um, but it would be anything that requires location on the ground. So, so yes, the containers would be considered a structure, and the grading would also be considered development. And what would right say that? The grading. Uh, the grading, okay, gotcha. And and the major major vegetation removal, likely. Mike, would those require a building permit for setting beyond the grading permit? Absolutely, yes. So anything that's going to require a building permit is probably going to be counted as a structure. Okay, got it. Uh, since we're there, Mike, why don't you cover any other building concerns that we might have right now? Certainly. 
Rob, I would first like to uh, talk about page number six that you emailed. Um, it has the urban or herbal legend store with the hay storage. I believe that's an old, outdated uh, site plan. Uh, and then with the uh, feed store next door, which is actually North Star Nursery now. Uh, uh -huh. Is it your intention to uh, use the North Star Nursery building as a mini storage as well, storage unit? You know, not right off the bat. I'm not sure. I, I wanted to start with the um, middle section, which is occupied now by the uh, Elder Moving Company. And they also rent the other building. I think it's on your record for the, the muffler shop. I don't know if it got updated to the uh, Elder Moving Company. So there's one separate building. And then, yes, there's three different businesses within that Herbal Legend building. And I would be developing the the middle part okay okay and the middle part is a two-story portion right correct yes yeah okay well i'm going to attempt to answer your questions for and this is uh not addressing the north star we're going to leave that for future but right now for the middle uh moving place in the in the rear muffler shop so your questions are, you were asking about ADA requirements. We refer to those as California accessibility requirements. Uh, you will be required as per California state law to bring those into access compliance. So what that means when you have your architect or engineer who you will be having prepare the plans and you're working with, they will need to be well-versed in, in current accessibility standards to guide you on what will be needed for accessibility. Uh, it's gonna start out at the front. Um, I don't know if you propose to put parking in front of Urban Legend adjacent to Highway 1, or if it's gonna be on the side, but parking, a parking space will be required for van unloading. A path of travel to the uh, place of business uh, in the interior bathroom, and I believe now you're crossing over the property line into that uh, western portion of the flag lot into North Star Nursery for the accessible bathroom, which is, is not allowed technically according to current standards. So you would have to address the bathroom issue as well. Um, so those do, are, I need a, do I those need are, a bathroom? Yes, you do need a bathroom. I do. Okay, so I have to leave that bathroom there. And you're saying it's it's part of that two part section in the back. So that could be an issue is what you're saying. It could. It's possible. Uh, when you speak with your architect or engineer, uh, please ask them if they're a CASP certified architect or at least knowledgeable in California accessibility requirements. W would it make sense and and thinking it might to just develop both of those spots at the same time kind of thing uh, that you know that's so, totally up to you it looks like the muffler shop is on a different parcel than the uh, urban legend uh, moving storage so it, it's up to you you know oh, oh so you're saying within that one building that larger two-story building there's a divide right within that building there that breaks up the the back end and then the middle section yeah yeah wow okay yeah it that's totally up to you on how you want to develop that um and those are your accessibility re general requirements with the limited information that i have um let's go on to the fire sprinkler system also what let me okay. back up a little bit with accessibility um, you are going to have to ask, you're going to have to uh, research the accessibility requirement to the second floor of the middle portion of that building. Uh, if vertical access is going to be required, and that's, that's something like a lift or an elevator. Uh, okay. So, so no stair option? It would have to be, you're saying, an elevator, and Steve brought this up a couple weeks ago, and that was another question I wanted to add on, but you're saying there's a chance I'd have to do an elevator or some type of lift for the second story. Or Maybe. The second part of it. It, it, it depends. Uh, if you're proposing 
uh, storage, the same amount of storage units and the same type of storage units on the second floor as you are the first floor, that could possibly be construed as equivalent facilitation, which may be allowed to be exempt from an elevator. And that's why your uh, accessibility architect is going to be so important. Okay. Rob, let's move on to the sprinklers. Um, you're, you are at that location, you are still, you're, you're within CAL FIRE, but they're not going to be the ones requiring sprinklers. You're within the rural Fort Bragg Fire District. The fire marshal in charge of that district is Steve Wells. He is the person in charge of requiring sprinklers on all commercial facilities within the rural Fort Bragg Fire District. So it would behoove you to give him a call or stop by his office, make an appointment, then stop by his office with this site plan and uh, just give him a quick overview of what you plan to do and get his feedback. He's, he's very open to that and he's very helpful, okay? Oh, okay, point. and just hearing it, it sounds like it may be required because the other issue too is, uh, you know, the property has water issues like everyone else does. That's not on a, you know, city uh, water system. So I don't, you know, I don't have the calx or I'd have to really get into it, but we might not even have the capacity possibly to do a sprinkler system. I mean, there's well, a nursery you would, there. You would yeah. have the capacity with an additional storage tank dedicated to fire suppression and a booster pump. And this, this okay. happens quite a bit. We, we have quite a few parcels with inadequate water and they add a storage tank and a small booster pump and there's your fire suppression supply right there. Okay, do you, do you know the size of the tank that I'd have to, or is that coming down to calx? And because I mean, it, it takes up room, which okay, I understand, and it, it just has yeah. to be done. But so that's determined. That's determined by a C16 contractor, a fire sprinkler contractor. They take into consideration the occupancy classification of the building, and how many sprinkler heads will be in there. And so that that's yeah. a calculation that takes some work. Okay. But I'll tell you, Steve Wells is going to be very helpful to you on this one portion, okay? Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. And then you ask about parking requirements from me, and I've already mentioned your access accessibility parking. That's going to be from the building code side. It's going to be one parking space with one van unloading space. Uh, but that's your parking requirements from building. Planning may have additional. And then last, and, and, and I'm sorry before you get far. So, so there would be a parking spot for the middle section of the urban legend building, and then there's the separate building. So there'd have to be a parking spot for that as well. So two total, is that correct? Yeah, I'm looking at the muffler shop on a separate parcel. Um, so yeah, that would need its own parking as well. Um, and if, okay. it have, if it didn't have its own parking, it would be possible to put two spots at the urban legend and then just have a path of travel to the muffler shop building um, that would be less than 5%. That's an accessible path. Um, however, it does cross a property line and I don't know what type of uh, deed recording goes along with that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the one to ask about that separate parcel. Um, you, you're also asking building about earthquake upgrades. So this project that you're proposing is a, it requires an occupancy, a building occupancy change. So the classification is going to change from an M occupancy, a retail, uh, to possibly an S1 or an S2, which is storage. And that does require, uh, there's some difference in the framing components and the structural integrity for this building uh, from what it was originally built. And an engineer is going to be able to help you with that. And they are going to incorporate the, the structural requirements for that occupancy classification change, which will include the earthquake upgrades. Right. Okay. So are you, are you talking to change, say, the footprint of the framing there? I mean, of course, adding to it. Um... No, no, no change in the footprint. Uh, within the same footprint, the interior, if you plan on stacking those metal storage pods on the second floor with fully loaded with storage goods, 
that's that's a, a big impacted load on this second floor structure and the exterior walls that it wasn't designed for that purpose originally. So sure. a structural engineer is going to help you with that design to ensure that uh, nothing dangerous is going to happen. It's going to be safe for its intended use. Sure. And those are all the questions that I have that you've posed for me. Did, uh, did I answer all of your questions? Yeah, um, let me just go through the email. I guess since we're on the parking part of it, so for the, you know, depending on how much I can develop, if I can, in the back for the pods, um, is there parking spaces that are needed for that? Or as long as there's enough width? Yeah, I've been around containers and rent them out, whatever, and, you know, there's kind of, what, a 25-foot opening and no real parking spaces. So is that going to be required at all for that back part or is it okay just for driving in and dropping off and then driving out? Yeah. So Rob, I, from building, I haven't addressed any questions on your back portion where you're proposing to remove all of the trees and put those separate pods. But here's my answer in a nutshell. Um, those pods, uh, a small percentage of them, maybe only one or two, uh, will need to be accessible pods. And maybe all of them are accessible now, depending on the way they're built. But you will need a parking space for a person with accessibility needs to park, unload, and use the pod. It makes the most sense to put that space right next to the accessible pod. Maybe the first pod, I don't know. But yes, you will need a parking space there for accessible parking at the rear portion. So, so you're saying, so per pod, so every pod I put in there, I have to have a, a, a separate parking spot for that versus the way a lot of these are set up, you would just drive up next to it. No, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. Uh, a small portion of the total amount of pods, possibly only one pod, will need to be accessible. Okay? And so if... if Seems like the best design would be the first pod as you enter would be your accessible pod and your accessible parking space would be next to that pod. Okay, so all the ones in the back, because, you know, on my map and, you know, I don't know if there's a limit brings up another question, but for my math that I worked out on the perimeter of the area that I was trying to put the pods on, I mean, I could probably get close to 90 of them. So I don't know if that number, um, you know, give or take is requiring more parking spots or hopefully it would still fall into that category. Like you said, so, when you first you know, go in, it would just require- So from a planning number. perspective, well, county code, uh, one parking space is required for each 300 square feet of gross floor area. And that includes the entire property. Um, and in addition, uh, for nurseries, one parking space is required for each 1,000 square feet of outside area, one parking space for each 300 square feet of indoor sales area. So this will all come in the calculation uh, depending on how much outdoor floor area there is for the nursery, and then indoor, and then what you're proposing. But there, there is going to be a, a quite a few parking spaces required. Um, I also just wanted to circle back on the question of lot coverage because this clearly is it's a very uh, important aspect. So as I defined earlier, as the code defines, a structure includes uh, buildings, but it also includes roads. So the paved road area, the, the driveways basically on the property, of which there are a lot, um, would be considered towards the maximum lot coverage. So that's very important to remember. Um, it, it's also determined by the permeability of it. So if it's an asphalt road, it's obviously impermeable. So it's, it's considered a structure according to lot coverage. But if you, I remember you were talking about placing the, the storage units on a gravel surface, a permeable surface. So, yeah, so crush crush granted if that makes a difference and i can do that throughout that whole area if that takes off the drive uh the driveway uh included into the lot size 
I was going to make it look consistent, you know, all the way throughout. And I can't remember if that's asphalt there now, but if I did the crushed gravel throughout, does that take the, that, that lot size off my lot? You're saying to remove the existing asphalt? If it's even there, I, I just, I should know, but I just forget. And I, I want to say it's almost where, something. Where are you bringing? Well, you were, you were mentioning that I lose some of my capability for development based on the roads that are there, unless, and maybe I heard you wrong, unless it's say gravel or crushed gravel in this case, crushed granite. That yeah, so what it would mean is that in the portion that you want to develop uh, into the temporary storage containers, uh, if you were to use gravel, crushed granite, that 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 portion would not count towards the lot coverage, but obviously the structures that you would be building or installing would. So a lot, there's basically a lot of give and take in terms of the what would be considered structure and, and lot coverage. The other item is to clarify what the surface is of the nursery lot, because that obviously is a huge portion of your site. And if that is paved, then that is considered a structure uh, for lot coverage purposes. And if it is gravel, you know, where the plants are in the nursery, then um, then that would not likely not count towards that. But uh, this is according to departmental uh, policy. So we would have to look into it. It was a it was a memorandum that was issued quite a few years back. So we would have to search in the archives for the current policy. Um, in addition, we would need to look at the uh, the approvals for the existing buildings that are there. As you mentioned, the the urban legend um, building, because perhaps in the original permit, it was required that they have a paved surface. So, if that was the case, then you would need to keep it revise that in order to remove that asphalt and, and convert it into a gravel paved surface, unpaved. Okay, but that, but that could be an option just for my own thought now that to gain more ability on my lot, um, I could get rid of that asphalt assuming it is not in conflict with the um, the uh, existing permit or I'd have to change it. Does, does that does that make sense to, to be able to gain that? If it's even asphalt, I don't even know. I'm starting to think it's just uh, some gravel. So I don't even think there's asphalt there to begin with. And I'm pretty sure within the nursery as well, it's not asphalt. It's, um, uh, you know, some so the, the surfaces that are the driveways around the urban legend building are, right. uh, it seems to be a mix. So it's, it's gravel, it, it's, it's paved adjacent to the building, but then it is gravel on the south side of the property. And then in between the urban legend and the older moving building, or sorry, the urban legend building and the North Star Nursery building, it is paved. And I believe in the back it's paved as well. And in the front of the nursery is paved as well. So yeah, there's certainly very intricate calculations that will need to be made, but, um, but it is looking like a, a good portion of the lot is considered to fall under lot coverage. So, um, so that 50% allowance um is is getting close to that if not already exceeded rob if i may i'd like this this is mike from building uh i want to i want to throw something out to you it's something very important to remember as far as lot coverage goes uh because it's so tight there you need to remember that uh planning's calculations for parking is what building bases their required accessible parking spaces on. If you're less than 25 spaces uh, required by planning, you only need one accessible space. If you are between uh, 25 and 75, you'll have two and then so forth. Just remember that the accessible parking spaces, uh, it's gonna be like a minimum of 18 feet depth, uh, probably 18 feet width, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, upwards of maybe 250 to 400 square feet of an asphalt or concrete area because of an accessible, disabled access parking space cannot be in a crushed granite area or a gravel area. It has to be hardscape, such as asphalt or, or concrete. So that is going to add to your lot coverage a little bit. I just want you to 
just be aware of it. It's, it I don't think it's a joke, okay. but I want you to be aware of it. Yep, thank you for that. Okay, um, let's go over to environmental health for septic and water concerns. And, and just before environmental health, Rob, I would recommend that you were asking about the uh, beverage kiosk. So that is something that environmental health would need to address in terms of the food safety. So I'd recommend that you bring that up um, after Marlena gives her initial presentation. It, it, the coffee stand you're saying? Yeah, I, I know Marlena would like to hear about that first or after uh, sharing what you prepared. I don't know why. I don't know why. I'm having a hard time just on you, your end, Steve. So can you say that again? Oh, uh, well, so you were mentioning that perhaps you wanted to introduce a coffee stand, a coffee kiosk, yeah. either on a trailer or a physically built one. So yep. um, it, because it, it involves beverage retail sales and, and beverage service, environmental health would have to weigh in in terms of the food safety issues, in terms of plumbing and whatnot. So I just wanted to bring that to the table for Marlena to discuss. Uh, okay, got it. Yeah, I don't see any plumbing there per se. I mean, it would be kind of just a simple, um, I'm sure you've kind of seen them on on uh, trailers that are you know all inclusive. I mean, there's going to be coarse water, but I'm assuming there's a tank in there or something along those. So I don't envision plumbing a pipe to the location on it, if that makes a difference at all. We'll see. Okay, before I get in, I would like a clarification about the required setbacks for the plan of these um, storage units along the property line. I thought I heard there was a 20 foot setback somewhere. Where exactly is that? So the 20 foot setback is for anywhere that abuts a, another zone that's not industrial or commercial. So the zoning for the properties behind on the, on the east side of the property is residential. So there would be a required 20 foot setback from that zone. So from the rear of the property, the east side of the property, but not to the north, south or west. So t towards the trees? Right. So the line of the properties that run along the back where the tree removal is being discussed, they would need, the pods would need to be set 20 feet back off that property line. Correct. Would there be required paving around that side or is that an option? No, I, it's, it, uh, the back is owned by a residential and then on either side, it would be the north and the south end are, are commercial. So there would, I don't know, there'd be no access that I, I don't think I can have in that back area. Okay, so it's potentially undisturbed? Uh, yeah, well, besides the house that's there in the back and then the, you know, either the north or south end of it, you know, there's already existing commercial businesses there. And then of course the, you know, the other end highway one. When I look at this lot, your main issue and I heard that you had three layers, even though it's defined as phase one and two, what I got for environmental health to talk to you about were three different things. The storage units, the potential of the mobile cart that did coffee, and then somewhere down the line in a few years, you may consider doing a small convenience store as well as a separate family style restaurant. So those are the three things I heard in your questions beyond basic septic requirements and basic water requirements. So I kind of want to address each one of those separately. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So the storage units, as far as septic goes and water goes, um, the septic requirement would be the least of course, because from the plans you sent, they don't have any plumbing in them. I, as environmental health, when you get a building permit, if your building permit is going to require an accessible bathroom, then the health department reviews the septic system that's going to support that accessible bathroom. We have two septic permits on record for these prop for these parcels. And I have their capacities and their designs. One's from 1989, one's a little later, around 1998. The 
issues with either of those septic systems is that neither of them had a replacement septic field identified when they were developed. So best case scenario for just the storage units would be a septic evaluation that said you could connect to one of the existing septic systems that's already supporting a structure for the accessible bathroom that I'm hearing is probably going to be required. And they would identify the future leach field for everything on the parcel. You wouldn't build it, but that section of the land would be reserved and memorialized in the file and no development would be allowed on it. No roads, no gravel, nothing. So finding a septic leach field that's gonna be your backup leach field for the future would be the biggest requirement I see for the storage structure portion of your plan. Let's, let's what's, what's the typical size of a leach field? So you're saying I might have to add another leach field, add a bathroom for that back uh, storage uh, development. Well, what I'm saying is best case scenario, you don't have to add a new one right now, but you have to submit a plan that shows where the next one's gonna be 10, 20, 30 years from now. You don't build it, but you have to reserve the land for it. it, it and do you know roughly how much uh, you know, square footage that takes up? I could not give you a stock answer. We design septic systems on a case-by-case -case basis, and it starts from the absorptive capacity of the dirt on site. So the better dirt you have, with the least amount of groundwater you have, the smaller the leach field you'll get. You will work with a septic engineer to identify the best place for leach field, which would get you the smallest footprint. Do you have a, the size in front of you on the existing leach field, just so I have a reference? Yeah. So the house is for a two bedroom house. That's 150 gallons per day per bedroom. So it's a 300 gallon per day design. We've got site maps for that, but I think you've got those. When you submitted your project, you included the map from the 2000 CDP. So I'm presuming that you've looked at that. I, you know, I've seen quite a bit of stuff and I, I kind of recall, yes, yeah, something in that regard. I just thought maybe if you had it in front of you, there was a, you know, okay, it's going to be, you know, 100 but, square feet or something or I don't Oh, well, the muffler shop is size is connected on the other side of the, what used to be the hay storage building that's now right. the larger building. So the septic for the muffler shop is on that other parcel and that's on record. The house septic is across the way by the garage, and that's a two bedroom design, three leach lines that is sized for 300 gallons per day. And pull that one's file. I'll tell you how long they are. They're 70, one is 70, and the other two are 75 feet long. So that's what they were required to have. So assuming so, so, so it's 75 feet long and is there a width on that at all? There are three of them and they're eight feet on center and five feet eight. on edges. Okay. So you may anticipate a similar size. Right. That's what I'm trying to, I mean, I'm just, you know, between the parking and, you know, accessibility and potentially Setbacks. a bath. Yeah. Which, you know, it gets real tight back there to do to, to you know do anything but um go ahead i'm sorry that's why i asked about the back stretch because if you can't develop that 20 feet that might be an available place for leach field ah that's very interesting so that helps so if need be that 20 foot setback in the back could be used for that leach field that's that's huge but would he need to remove the trees in order to install the leach field Depends on the size, mostly just the larger. We don't remove them. We cut them and grind them down in place. You don't rip out holes and filters, you know? So um, it would be much less. Okay, right. but, but that would be part of that plan to utilize, if need be, that area for uh, a future leach field. Um, so that, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, 
if that's the designated replacement area, they would need the coastal development permit to install it when it needs to be installed. This is a theoretical reservation area. It's not something sure. that's going to be built. Is that right? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me? Included in the. Uh, so, so because it's theoretical, likely it would not be included in the current CDP that that he would be requesting. Um, okay, Rob. Just so you know, uh, twenty feet is is really not that large of a portion of the the forested area. The forested area is kind of more like um, it's about a hundred and ten feet from the property line. So. Just so you know, the, the, the first 20 feet is just a few of the trees along the edge. Um, so you, you still would have a lot of trees that, that you would be required to remove. Just want to put that out there. Yeah, within the 20 foot setback you're saying as well, or just after that line? I'm saying that the 20 foot setback doesn't really capture a lot of the forest. So a lot of the forested area is, is it's about 120 feet from the property line. So there would be 100 feet of forest that um, you would need to get permitted to remove. Yeah, because like I, I had mentioned before, when I actually went there, I did a count and, and literally for that, you know, after the 20 foot setback, I only counted 15 trees, you know, five of them, you know, were maybe that bigger than that two foot di di diameter. And then the other ones were very small and, you know, it's just a lot of brush. So there's there's not that many trees to, to get to the point of, um, you know, opening up that area. Mobile food cart? Are we ready? Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so there's two different aspects before to that. You, Marlena, before you continue, could I just say something really quick? Sure. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the bathroom needs for the back portion of the pods, but if the back pods uh, don't have an office or no employees for that portion, it's likely that that will not need a bathroom. That, that, I didn't mention that. The, bath, the accessible bathroom is going to be in the existing moving company where Urban Legend is. Now, they already have a bathroom there, so that means that they would have to simply remodel the existing bathroom to bring it into compliance with current bathroom standards. But I just ah. want to tell you that the rear pod section where those 90 pods are going to go, unless there's an office or an attendant or an employee back there, it, it's possible that a bathroom will not be required back there. Okay, that could, could I tie it in and, and no, based on what you said, there'll be no employee, there'll be no building, you know, I'll just make sure of that. Could I incorporate that one bathroom within the middle section of the herbal legend building, building to be used if needed um, for the back storage pods? You could with the simple path of travel. Fortunately, that's a level lot. So to achieve that one in 20 slope, which is 5%, it, it's possible, yes. Yeah, okay. So that's comforting, that's very nice. And then I would just use, I mean, I've been around a lot of storage container facilities and you know, some have bathrooms, some don't. Um, so, but if they're able, just in case they're able to use that. So I would, would I still have to, you know, prepare for a future leach field down the line if I'm able to use that existing ba uh, bathroom and leach field? Yes, that's going to be okay. your least level of septic requirement. Okay, so and, and again, I could hopefully use or at least some of it that that 20 foot setback in the back. Maybe. Which is great. Yeah. Have to okay. Dig back there. Okay, so the mobile food cart. When you get a food facility permit, you would apply to this department for a food facility, non-fixed or a mobile food facility permit. One of the things that you're going to need in that application is an agreement called a commissary agreement that documents that this mobile unit will be removed daily or weekly and taken to another permitted food facility for servicing. So you'll really need to think about the mobility of that unit. It doesn't get to sit there unless it is connected to water and sewer. So the mobile food cart is definitely a possibility, but you're gonna to have to take it 
to another food facility that has a fixed food facility permit for dumping, refilling, cleaning, storage, stocking. And is this something that I would be able to do right away after the purchase if I do buy it? Um, or do I need to go through a use permit and whatever that might take, which would be six months to a year? Because, you know, the, the rental amount on that property now is very minimum. And I've mentioned this to Steve a few times. I'm trying to, you know, generate an income. And that was my idea with this, you know, coffee stand. Um, so, is, again, is that something I can start right away as long as it's not fixed with plumbing? So you would require a business license, which are which is issued quarterly. Uh, so there's a few months there, uh, including the application process. And then also uh, you need to ensure that you're not taking up any of the required parking spaces for the current use. So for example, if you wanted to park in the, in the lot that is by the nursery, you need to make sure that you're not taking up any spaces that are required for that. And then likely you would also require spaces for the uh, cart itself. And this is not including uh, the idea of it being drive through, which you'd mentioned, because if it is drive through, um, it, it would need a stacking area for five vehicles in addition to the parking requirements. So that is um, quite hefty and it, it wouldn't be able to impede the flow. So, um, do you know how many parking spots are allotted for the nursery right now? A lot of what, but uh, like oh, I said, well, well. the uh, one parking space is required for each 1,000 square feet of outside area, plus one parking space for each 300 square feet for indoor sales area. So just a quick aerial approximate uh, measurement of the nursery area tells me that it is it is oh 18,000 square feet so that would be approximately 18 parking spaces required uh which i'm not sure that they that even exists at this point so yeah so because i was thinking if for some reason they have more parking than say they're they need to then i could work off of that but based on your quick math there um they might even not have enough already and does that come back to me after the purchase that i have to do something in it would be regard be a non-conforming use but any development that you would do on the site would trigger the the um the reallocation of those parking spaces okay wow so so if there's not 18 there now then i have to once that transfer happens i have to say bring it up to code with the amount of uh parking spaces, which that would encroach, I think, in the, the existing lease. I'm um, going to have to, you know, review it again for the nursery, but I don't think there's anywhere close to 18 existing parking spots for the nursery. Sure. And then that's also plus the indoor sales area, which I haven't been in, inside the North Star Nursery building, so I'm not sure, but just looking at it, if, uh, if, if the main part of the building, not the, the wing to the east, is the sales area that's about 2,000 square feet. So divided by three, that's about seven parking spaces required. So that's 18 plus seven, and that's also plus the moving company and the urban legend. So there's a, a required parking. Obviously, does take up a lot of the space that you're looking to develop, uh, and that's likely, perhaps that's why there is that paved area in the back of the nursery that's not necessarily a delineated parking area, but but people tend to park there. Perhaps they added that for um, for parking for the nursery. Okay, yeah, because even with that, and I'm just trying to get a visual mentally over there, I just don't think they have it. So that's going to be, again, on me to update all of that for that matter, whether it's it, you know, you know, parking, more spots, whatever. Right. Okay, so that gets rid of my idea on the, if I go fixed, uh coffee but still i don't think the parking's there to even do it and that would probably be true for the family restaurant um, i get rid of the drive-through part of it but then that would accommodate more parking which i don't think i just out of the room uh to do it hey so i got some information on that conversation that you should follow up on in my records there was a coastal development permit processed in 2000 cdu 
a use permit, three of 2000. A part of that was a parking plan that I happen to have a copy of. It identified 24 lots total, or parking spaces total on it. it there's a map, it counts them one, two, three, four, between the feed, what was then the feed store, the hay store, the muffler shop, the house, with the two car garage included. So there is a copy of a plan from 2000 that may be a place for you to start, but still that's 22 years old. But on this, in the back area, there is the note, additional parking available. And there is a note within the planner's report of this use permit that was noticed for public hearing that specifically states, in addition to the 24 parking spaces available, including the two for the residents, there is an undeveloped rear portion of the property that is available for parking should future development of the site occur. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and of course, that's the area that I was trying to put the containers and then with the container idea, you know, there's also the, the parking requirement, but thank you. And I'll, and I'll look further into that. So you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, there's 24 existing parking spots that are, are, are used for the existing businesses there, including the residential in the back. That was what was in the application in 2000 that was approved. Right. Okay. Got it. What's happened over the last 20 years on site? I don't know. Okay. okay. Thank you. So we go to fixed facility, which is even more of your square footage, right? Unless you were going to convert one of the structures. Right. And you are already getting the picture that space is, um, you know, there's Very not limited. a lot necessarily available. So for a restaurant design, you'd need to submit it to the health department for a plan review you'd also need to submit to the building department for a building permit these are two different plan reviews so um i want to be clear before you build it you need two different permits issued one from the health department one from the building department besides whether or not this would require anything from planning um and it would require a report that says you have enough leach field to support this um type of structure and in your email you mentioned either a convenience store or a separate family style restaurant slash bar all three of those categories have different sizing requirements so when you have a septic engineer you could talk to them about those three different sizing requirements do i have enough room for just a convenience store versus a small restaurant or restaurant and bar so all of those are sized off the use type and the the um equipment, the scale that's inside of it. We're going to rate your water use from all the um, proposed fixtures that you are proposing to install in the building. So we won't have that exact number until you turn in the exact cut sheets for all the proposed pieces of equipment to be used. And I'll pause there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, um, um, well, I was just pausing in case, because I thought you might have a question. No, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes, I don't have a question at this time. There would, would, if you wait a couple years for this, or plan a couple years for this expanded use, when you're doing your septic design right now, you would need to think about that now, because you might build over the only usable spot for your future restaurant. So that's something to just mention when you right. work with your engineer. Because the same, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect, thank you, got it. And I'm, I'm looking at my email here to see if there's any further Oh, questions. there's water. We gotta talk about water. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're in the coastal zone and you're in the marginal water district as I understand from this report and the map. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So there is going to be a water requirement. And there's two options there. 
One is going to be either a proof of water, which is a water quantity test, how much water in general is available. The other is called a hydrological study. The deciding factor for which of those requirements will be applied to this project is your proposed gallons per day. For our code, if it's above 1500 gallons per day total cumulative for everything, then you're absolutely going to be required to do a hydrological study. If it's below that, you will most likely have to do a water quantity test. With the recent drought out there, we will have questions, you know, detailed questions about how much water you might need to store on site. So another potential tank um, of, of water storage there. <clears throat> potentially. And that would come up all over again potentially with the building of a restaurant or the converting of one of the structures to a restaurant. Is there anything to be said? I don't know if they do this kind of management, but I know, you know, especially if I'm able to take down the trees in the back, they, they do, you know, I think it was a redwood tree I did some research on, you know, per day they can take up to say 500 gallons of water, which I was completely blown away that I didn't know they took that much. So. If some of the trees in the back go down, that might, you know, actually help the the water situation there because, of course, there's a nursery and, you know, wow, that's probably the wrong business to have there with the lack of water that we have. But is there any management that would be considered that would encourage the trees to come down in efforts of giving more water to that property? That does not sound familiar to me. I have not had a project in a like the last 10 years, well, that was something that we considered. If you take down so many trees, then we can anticipate anticipate so much water. I was flipping through the three records here because I know we have record of one well. Here we go. I think there's two total on there. Well, I have I have the one from 2005. There might be an older one, maybe. Yeah, it says it was hand dug. There would be no record of that. We didn't permit hand dug wells. So yes, your hand dug well is probably much more effective than the drilled well. And with regards to the trees, the drilled well goes down 205 feet. So it's pretty deep. I would think that the trees may affect your shallow hand dug well, but your deeper well that you would actually perform these tests from is less likely to be affected by the removal of trees, particularly in the same year. Okay. Got it. That's it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I said that's it. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> um, any other insight or information from anyone? I'm just quickly looking through my emails here and I think most of the questions were, were answered. It was just the, well, okay, the fixed coffee stand that would of course just take up more, you know, lot size and then require parking yeah um rob let's go to transportation real quick i'm not sure if they're going to have any comments but uh, alex do you have anything yeah uh this is off uh state highway one so uh in terms of county transportation uh we would have no comments um i don't you know you would need to check with caltrans to see if they would have any comments but you know the mo most of the access onto the property there's you know, a nice paved, uh, uh, wide paved area out front, which usually, um, you know, they're looking at the connection to the highway. Um, so I, I don't know if I'd anticipate and much from them, but um, they may have some comments. Okay. Okay. Okay, Rob, did you have any other questions or anything for us? I feel like we kind of gave you an information dump here. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, I'm going to have to definitely digest everything for, um, you know, a few days here. Is there someone that, uh, you know, with me personally, I'm sure like a lot of people, I just need to step away from all this and think about it. And I'm sure by Monday, um, you know, I can probably have some further questions. Do I just communicate with Steve or do I 
have the ability if need be to communicate with any of you and i'm not trying to put my pressure on to you guys but i do have to make a decision pretty soon here sure um, yeah i would say pre- coordinate through steve and then you know if it's a question for eh or dot he can route those appropriately okay great and like i said i'm gonna dedicate this weekend just to you know meditate on all this and then uh, i'll probably have a you know a few questions by monday okay all right okay uh, thanks. that was a good Thank discussion you. Yeah, I appreciate your time, everyone, and um, uh, thank you. And I just want to make sure, oh, did you hang up? No, no, I'm here. Okay. The beginning, we got lost into more details, but just the conversion internally of those structures that you started talking to Mr. Oliphant about uh huh, would still require a septic reserve field be identified. So that is going to be there for that, too. Okay, so the back, okay, gotcha. Okay. In case you think of that tomorrow. Yeah, uh, say it again, I'm sorry. In case you think of that tomorrow. Get, got it, understand. Perfect. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I think that's it, so I just hang up, and um, I'll be in touch soon uh, with Steve, um, you know, by Monday. Thanks, Rob. Rob. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so that takes us on to agenda item six, which is matters from staff. Does anybody have any matters from staff? It should be Marlena's item. Okay, I got three questions. <laughs> um, I understand that Matt Goins is going to be assigned subdivision pretty soon. Is that going to be by next subdivision? Like, What's the timeline do you guys think for that? Uh, we don't really have anything set. We're just, it's kind of a slow transition process, you know, between both our workloads. And obviously there's a lot of variety in the meetings. This one is mostly discussion, so it doesn't really take any action. You know, once we get to a meeting that has a lot of, um, a lot of input from the committee, like subdivisions and things, you know, we're just going to kind of feel it out. But for, for the meantime, still coordinate through me, if that's your question. Okay. I know that none of us know when we're switching over to the other operating system from GroupWise, hmm. but not on the table. But is it possible to send subdivision invites as an appointment and not as an email? Not through Zoom. It would have to be done from someone's personal GroupWise calendar. Uh, yeah, so we could do that once we had the, the meeting invite from our admin. Um, I could just send that as an appointment to you guys. Yeah, because right now I have 500, no, I have 601 at new emails, and yours was way at the bottom, and it doesn't show up in my appointments, so sometimes I, I think it would just be easier if it was a set appointment, like all my other Zoom meetings are. Okay. Um, how far ahead of the meeting do we usually get that link? We can do it, it as early as it's set, so I mean, honestly, we could do it up to a month in advance, most likely. Okay. Um, so what's what's typically the best amount of time for you guys to review these projects? A week or so before? No, way more. Half of these files, actually all of these files were coast files. So we got to get them from the coast. I have to read them. I have to notice the stuff that's missing and ask for it. So one day, like yesterday, no. <laughs> um, that's not enough. That's assuming I'm even here really a minimum of one week and it takes my staff days to pull all the files and process them and log them in before they give them to me so two weeks is really our minimum so how much um what what's our lead time what's the cutoff date for when planners your open? guys cutoff date to turn it into admin is three to four weeks and then we usually organize the agenda work back and forth between if there's boundary lines that are coastal or not for about a week. And then when the email blast goes out that it's posted online, that's when it goes to all the other agencies if they want comments or to download their packets. Okay, and that's roughly two weeks? Minimum before. of 10 days, maximum 14 ish. Okay. 10 to 14 days. So if we did that, that is that so that's when they usually get the packet too? Well, they should get the email blast. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you're not getting that in the 10 to 14 days before the hearing? It varies. Okay. Some are, some aren't. This one, kind of, mostly. 
The last it's one. Tough no. with pre-apps, yeah, because they they kind of don't go the same schedule because there's no noticing or anything required for it. <clears throat> okay. All right, I'm going to make some notes here and I'll follow up with you. Uh, did you have something else? I thought you said there were three things. No, I, I thought so too. I've lost it. We'll let it go. I'm sure I'll bring it up next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, nothing oh, on my end. That's it. I know we don't know, but if it's decided that the next one's going to be in person, please give me as much heads up as possible. I, I don't even know that we'd have a place to do it right now unless we went back to conference room C. So it, I, I don't expect the next meeting to be in person and probably not for some time. Okay. There's been literally no discussion about that. So. It goes to the board March 15th. We're following executive office policies, so whatever they start to push out at the end of March and April is how we'll start to organize. Okay. I'm just saying, once you know, please let me know. Right. Mm -hmm. Will do. Thank you. That's everything. And Alex, you got to stop laughing. <laughs> I look and I'm like, what's he laughing about? I wonder what he's, who's, who's in the office now? What are they saying? I get totally yeah. distracted. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think we're on to agenda item seven, adjournment. Can we get a motion to adjourn? I motion that we adjourn. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Thanks, guys. We'll see you Thank later. Thank you.